Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Le titre de ma présentation aujourd'hui, c'est « L'utilisateur, c'est moi » ou en anglais « Me, I am the user ». And um, of course, if you're speaking in front of uh, such a, a reputable audience, you can't uh, do a presentation without proper reference. And I have uh, chosen this uh, guy called Louis Catorz as uh, somebody that, uh, uh, to some extent, um, inspired me for to the title of this presentation. And what I want to speak about today is a bit of the historical background that at least the German hacker scene, which I feel um, home at, uh, has built up within the past three and a half decades. So um, since I've learned that many of you are not from Germany, some of you might actually hear something new. Those of you who are from Germany should be ashamed if there's anything new in my presentation for you. So this is merely a repetition. Um, I want to speak a little bit about sovereignty. Um, according to Wikipedia, sovereignty is the full right and power of a governing body over itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. Um, basically, this guy was a sovereign because he was the king of France. Um, in political theory, sovereignty is a substantive term designating supreme authority over some polity, and a polity is basically a political entity defined by common criteria such as identity, um, resources, and some kind of organization. This is a very complicated um, definition and probably that hasn't had of not much use. I am, um, when I went to university, uh, not today, but I, I actually did go to university. I didn't study um, information science because um, you shouldn't do that if you're a German hacker. We are obliged to at least not finish studying information science. So I had to study psychology and um, sociology, politology, forensic psychiatry, all that stuff. And uh, during my studies, I learned a different definition for sovereignty, and that is, sovereign is she who decides on the exception by a somewhat controversial political philosopher, at least in Germany. And of course, we all know who decides on the exception on our computers. Back when I started working with computers, I basically my interface to this computer was this, this little command prompt, but obviously I would be lying if I told you that this was basically what, what I was looking at all day, it more looked like this because I was a big Gianna Sisters fan. The background to this computer was I, um, I actually wanted a Nintendo very badly. And my father only gave me this Commodore 64, and he said, you need, to, you need to have something that is not a consumer TV, but something that you can do something with. So I did something with it and played Gianna Sisters. Eventually, I got a, a personal computer. Many of you have had one of those, I suppose. Big box, you put it under, the, under your desk, and then you have an, a user interface like this uh, or maybe later like this. And I know some of you, for some of you, it looked more like this here, yeah, like a, you already had a bash or a SH command prompt and maybe the KDOS desktop environment or something. You were already, you had already converted to higher spheres, uh, which I only reached later. And then eventually moving on with computer evolution, my um, interface looked like this and, uh, or like this, you know, depending on whichever side of the barricade you were fighting on. And then something very strange happened, and that is, um, I basically looked at it with quite some discomfort. And then, and that is, this is, computers eventually looked like, like this. And, and obviously, the first thing that comes to your mind is, they took my keyboard away. But not only that, they also took your compiler away. So that these are the first 
um, computers that are commonplace that you cannot program yourselves anymore. Before that, you, whether you had a Windows computer or a, a Linux system or, you know, a, a BSD system, the computer came ready to be programmed by you. Now, obviously, few people cared about it. So it was perfectly fine to remove a keyboard, remove a compiler, charge people to program for it, build app stores and all that. So the, apparently, we were all fine with this because most people didn't need it. Um, and I want to acknowledge the upside. Um, during this evolution of the personal computer, the personal computing device, every year there was more and more that people could do with these machines and achieve using these machines. And they were b being empowered more and more every day. And it's, those machines certainly enabled me to do more and more in my life, you know, communicate with friends and all that. Yet, if you look at this from a perspective of sovereignty, it was all downhill. We cannot, but you, you basically cannot buy an iPad and write iPad software on an iPad. You have to buy yet another computer, um, download this, this whole uh, software development environment, and if you want to actually you know, make the software available to others, you have to uh, pay a yearly fee to some app store provider and give them a third of your of your gross income with this software. And I'm not sure that this was a particularly good uh, development. Now, I want to go back to, the, back to the 80s when the um, Chaos Computer Club, and the German hacker organization, and probably the largest hacker organization in Europe, was founded. And it was founded by people at the beginning of the 80s who were already working with computers back then. And obviously, back then, a computer was not in your home. It was not something you had on your, uh, on your desk in a, in a, that you would find on a desk in a, in a regular person's home, just as you would find a, a smartphone in everybody's pocket today. Um, and these guys, coming from a quite leftist perspective in, on, on society, um, decided that they should meet and discuss how computers would shape our society, how our societies would evolve using computers. And um, they decided to place a little text in a, in a German left-wing newspaper and ask for, for a meeting of computer enthusiasts. And this is what they wrote in 1981. Those in power today believe that national security can only be achieved by the use of computers. Does that sound familiar? Is that something you could write today? I think so. We're now facing biometric surveillance systems. We are killing people using semi-autonomous drones. We have data retention laws on all the data that we basically transmit over whatever network we choose to use. And in 1981, these guys already knew it. The realization that computers cannot go on strike is beginning to dawn even on mid-sized companies. Does that sound familiar? I think it does. Um, some very sarcastic individuals say that the main reason um, Amazon is even still employing people in their warehouses is that they have hands and com like robot arms are just not good at as versatile as human hands yet. By the time you have this breakthrough, these people are going to be out of a job just as truck drivers and all that. I, I don't need to tell you all this. I just want to sh share with you my impre my uh, my uh, awe at the you know people understanding this 30 over 35 years ago. The Postal Service now believes they need to prove through field trials that the telephone will be even nicer with their computer-based screen text systems. Now, I mean, our uh, relationship with the Postal Services has changed in the past. Well, back, back then, the CCC's discussion with the Postal Services was mainly that they wanted to use their modems and weren't allowed to build their own ones. I guess by now our main discussion with them is we want to use the internet and they're not building one, at least in Germany. 
The latest ad campaigns make it clear that the personal computer is now being foisted on video saturated BMW drivers in Germany. Now, nothing against BMW drivers, although they are a pain in the ass if you're a bicyclist. But I guess what, what I read in this what, what I read in this sentence is that these people were introduced to computers as consumers. They were given computers as a consumption device. Consume videos, consume prawn, consume whatever video game. But they were not introduced to computers as a means for empowerment and a means for uh, independence or creativity. And this is what, to some extent, hurts me every day when I wake up and take my iPad and read Twitter, <laughs> consuming other people's um, excrements. Um, we believe, and this is the important part, we believe that despite all these useful things can be done with home computers, without a need for large centralized organizations. At that point in time, there wasn't even a large centralized organization uh, that you would you know, call Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, or even the internet. It just didn't exist back then. And they already knew where we would be, you know, what would be our main headache uh, in 2018. And so they said, to keep us computer freaks from puttering around aimlessly any longer. We're doing something and we'll meet in Berlin on 12th September 1981. And I find it very interesting because to some extent I see those who work with computers today and work on the good stuff, they're also oftentimes, you know, at least it's, I have that feeling that I'm puttering around aimlessly and not striving for a higher goal. You know, I'm trying to finish my coding project, trying to satisfy a customer, trying to fix that damn bug so I can fix the next one. And sometimes we lose the vision for, for what we're even doing here. So when they met on this random uh, day in, in 1981, they decided to talk about international networks, communications law, data processing law. They asked the question, who owns my data? at a point in time when nobody even had data yet. There was no such thing as people having data. I mean, they had a date of birth and a name. Copyright, information and learning system, databases, encryption, computer games, programming languages, process control, hardware, and whatever else. And I dare to say, we ha basically haven't stopped talking about these issues ever since. While well, everybody else now updates their Instagram and Facebook accounts without even thinking about these questions. And me, they, I mean, I never really let go of these questions and they somehow annoy me throughout my life. Because I certainly dreamt of a different future with this whole internet thing when I was introduced to it being 11 years old. Um, and I had my first uh, 56k modem and I dialed up through uh, a school network and I saw the internet and realized that now the world had to some extent changed and there was now a, a way to get a direct connection between basically any computer that is connected to this network and any other computer that is connected to this network. And it seems like, like this is long, for, long forgotten days. Um, the, the telecommunications networks now basically fight against their role of being mere providers of tubes, tubes used by Google, Amazon, Facebook to make billions, and um, the telecommunications networks basically being their, their infrastructure provider, but nothing more than that. And I was hoping for a, for a more decentralized network. At least this is what I was promised by the hacker ethics, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. They were first published in a book by Stephen Levy, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. And um, over the time, CCC added two little um, sentences to these ethic principles that we all try to follow and that I would 
like to advertise to you now. Access to computers and anything which might teach you something about the way the world really works should be unlimited and total. Always yield to the hands-on imperative. Now, I'm not sure if that is still the case anymore today. If you look at the United States, where basically education costs you a fortune before you can ever make one. And yet in this whole internet sphere, and this is the, the one and only community where I've ever really seen this endless spirit to create knowledge and to share knowledge with each other. Speci specifically when I went to university, I already learned that this was not really in the genome of people to share knowledge. You know, be sick one day and ask your fellow students for their, for their notes uh, that they took during uh, the lecture that you were that you were missing. Interestingly, um, since I was studying in in Berlin here, and um, I'm I'm from the former uh, western part of Germany, and our uh, class was basically 50% uh, former eastern part, 50% former western part. Um, the people that had a, a Eastern background, Eastern German background, they were they were basically ready to share everything. They were ready to, you know, help each other. They would support each other. Um, and the people that came from the West wouldn't. Now we know how history decided which which culture would be predominant from then on, and I think we still see it today. All information should be free. Now, what does free mean? It doesn't. I mean it. There's, as you know, there's free as in free beer and free as in free software. Some of us uh, are debating nowadays whether all information should be made available to everybody. But I think somebody still needs to stand, even needs to stand the ground of um, of saying, okay, if we keep information away from people, that basically means. Um, stealing their sovereignty, stealing their means of empowerment, stealing their ways to decide for themselves, and that in the end probably means we're giving somebody else more power than we're giving others. And you see the, the leftist background, mistrust authority and promote decentralization. This is, I mean, this is, the internet hasn't really listened to that one in the past 20 years, right? We're trying to tell everybody, you know, run your own software, run your own servers, run your own mail server, and, you know, decentralize the web. Because back then, that was the miracle of the internet, that it was a decentralized network, where there were no central nodes, where you could destroy single nodes, and the internet would, would root around damage and still function. A couple of... Uh, BGP roads changed, and uh, somehow the internet is, is still able to connect everybody with everybody. Now, all this had a military background to be achieved, yet um, there were certain societal benefits and um, it was obviously a, a cultural revolution for, for most of the world. Yet, looking at it a couple of decades later, we basically have a few centralized authorities that define not only what we're using on the internet, but also what we can do on the internet. Facebook decides you can now no longer send a message to your friend or more than five friends or whatever they may decide. Um, this is the new reality. And, and Facebook is written in PHP, if I'm not mistaken. So there's a lot of reason for decentralization there and mistrusting authorities. One thing, I mean, it's, I mean, this is an obvious one. You should judge hackers and people by their acting and not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position. I mean, this is, this usually goes without saying. Unfortunately, if I look at the internet today and the way people use it as a communications medium, it seems like they also haven't listened to this advice too much which also saddens me. Um, I was hoping that the internet revolution would uh, lead to you know, more communication, empathy, and understanding between cultures. 
Um, I'm not saying it has led to more hate between cultures, but it certainly has not led to much more um, discourse and understanding between people. And the way we're using it in social networks nowadays, it probably won't. You can create art and beauty on a computer. Now, that is an, an obvious one to, to all of us, yet I'm sure many people have been using computers for decades without ever creating anything beautiful. And that is a sad thing. Whoa. Computers can change your life for the better. I mean, that has certainly, that has certainly happened to, to most of us, right? Um, that's what I'm, you know, on, on, on my Saturdays, I'm, t I'm telling myself that, you know, Probably computers made my life better, even though I have to admit that every once in a while the thought crosses my mind to to just be done with this and uh, you know find a new thing, something with you know i don 't know working with wood or something don 't mess around in other people 's data don 't mess with other people 's data so when at a, okay at this point in time, few people already had data and it 's um when I come to this, uh, when, when, we, when we mention this part of our ethics, it's always, uh, there are always some surprised eyebrows because after all, we are a hacker organization, so we hack computers. And usually you hack computers because there is data on there that you would like to look into and that data is probably not yours. Now, you may decide that it should be yours or everybody's. Um, but we pride ourselves to work with um, a moral standard that um, respects the privacy of, of other people. And um, our goal is to make public data available and to protect private data. Now, why do we think this is necessary? We think it's necessary because this is the only way to get a level playing ground between whatever governmental body is in power and those who are subject to this power. So you see nowadays that basically uh, state agencies want to make more and more data secret, more and more knowledge secret. They want to tell less and less about what they're doing, while at the same time they want to know more and more about you and everybody else. And this is a very, very dangerous um, imbalance of, of checks and balances and imbalance of power. And I think an imbalance of power is always bad for the development of a society. So by making data available of the public, making public data available to the public, um, we have a means to understand and influence politics. And that is the basic role of information. While when we have lost all our private data to one specific entity, um, we're basically at their, um, uh, we're, we're basically subjected to their, uh, to their will and we can't really defend ourselves anymore. So what does this all mean Re with regards to sovereignty, which my, my argument is we are losing at the moment. You, of course you all know and love XKCD, and I would argue that the sovereign is she who is in ETC pseudo us. Why would I use a computer that I do not have root access to? Why would I even use such a machine? The wonder, the beauty of computers was that these computers could be shaped into anything. They came with an ugly command prompt and I could uh, make it say hello world. And if I decided to say, hello, other world, I had suddenly created two worlds. And I was able to do that on my computer, even though my skills were limited. And I certainly, at this point in time, was not a very good programmer. And I was not a very skilled programmer. It's, I certainly didn't take the world forward. But the fact that computers were built this way is the reason that all this evolved. 
this is the reason the computer was a, a wonderful um, invention. This was this is the reason we're living better lives today. That computers were universally programmable by whoever decided to program them. And now we're losing this. We're losing this to an extent that universally programmed computers are being sold to us as things. At the point that um, we're buying, I don't know, light bulbs with computers in them and, and uh, scales with computers in them and um, heating thermostats with computers in them and we're actually made to believe that these are things. We don't understand anymore that there is a MIPS or ARM um, CPU in there and this thing could still be a dog on the internet. So you've all heard this one, but this, I mean, in the end, this is what it comes down to. If you do not own your data, there is no way in hell you're going to be sovereign. It, it's just not going to happen. And sometimes I feel like being in the internet, like the, the little prince um, yelling into this, this world that I don't understand that I am the user after all, and I want to decide how things are supposed to be going. Now, there are little, there's a little we, be we basically can do about it, and you guys and girls are doing it. So this is what I want to thank you for, um, and I want to encourage you to keep doing your work and fighting to maintain these possibilities for, for all of us. And I don't think that, you know, in 20 years, there's only going to be, um, you know, a decentralized pile of Nextcloud instances in this world. But it's very important that even though the mainstream moves into a different direction, we maintain these spaces of, of autonomy and sovereignty over our own data. Because if there is, if something beautiful is going to be invented and developed, it's going to be invented in those spaces. So with regards to today, where you're basically unable to buy a computer anymore that, that gives you absolute sovereignty, and if you do, there's limited things to do with it. You're not going to be able to communicate with your friends on Facebook. But it's so important to understand all this and to maintain the options that we have and give, give people who want to escape all this, people, people who want to liberate themselves an opportunity and the means to do so. Once we stop doing that, we've lost the bell. And now I'm speaking about this as a, um, a white European male, but um, what we tend to forget being uh, this quite privileged group of, of internet developers, uh, whatever you may call it, there are large um, numbers of people in this world that have not yet uh, gained connectivity to the internet. Now, um, I've worked in uh, some of these countries where m you know, way more than half of the population ha has never been online. And what I find very interesting is they are not going to um, go through the stages of development that, that I just explained at the beginning that I witnessed going from a personal computer on my desk to a, an interconnected computer that was suddenly able to talk to other computers to basically a consumption device. They are not going to go through this development anymore. They're, going, they're not going to have copper cables that they connect their computers to to get um, uh, internet connectivity. They're going to get the consumption devices that are being handed out to people now. Probably a smartphone will be their first and probably a, a one and only computer that they're getting. And they're going to be introduced to a world where they're basically little lit up boards that you can touch. And they are maybe never going to reach the, the means to understand how they work. They're probably not going to get into positions where they would even you know, uh, understand writing or reading code, let alone getting a job that would empower them to, to work with 
to, to change anything about the anything relevant about the systems they're working with. And this is what it's all about, empowerment. And we're really, really missing out on this. Decentralization, I talked about it a long time. And of course, one thing that I'm a very fierce advocate for, net neutrality. Another thing I witness in, in countries that where, where you know mobile networks are, mobile data networks are now being built is that the, the idea of net neutrality does not cross anybody's mind. These networks are built for consumers. There's no such thing as you know create uh, treating data packets equally. There's competition and you want to limit the competition. So I said I would um, have some historic references and I want to come back to this historic uh, reference. This is not really a talk, or this was not a talk about the good old days. Um, this, is, this was a talk about how we somehow messed up in the bad old days and how we need to shape a better future. And if I look at my little reference, Louis XIV here, who said uh, l'état, so the state, that's me, in 1701. I would much rather see uh, a, u a user, a utilizer of computers uh, that looks a bit like this. And in France, this happened only 77, uh, 87 years later. Was a bit messy and a bit bloody. Maybe we've learned and we can uh, get this over with a bit more peacefully. But I hope that um, we'll somehow achieve greater levels of liberty, equal equality, and um, fraternity <laughs> um, in the years to come with this wonderful network of machines and ideas and people that we have created for ourselves. And I hope that we maintain the sovereignty over this wonderful network. And with this, I would like to leave you and say thanks. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. I have to admit, none of these thoughts were mine, right? It's all like 30 years ago that people came up with all this. I, I, I just realized it was very... Well, there was one that yours that you should take responsibility for, which is the one that you said that after 20 years, not everybody will be using Nextcloud. I was rather sad to hear you think that. I would, I, I mean, I'm certainly hoping that would, that, that that's going to be the, that, that that's going to, going to happen to some extent. And I, I mean, I was, I was talking to Marie earlier and I'm, I see this is a, a community with a growing user base and that's very good. Oh, very much. But uh, let's see, at least hopefully, I mean, Frank has once an interview, uh, a journalist asked him, you know, aren't you afraid that like Google and, and Apple and Microsoft steal your ideas? And I was like, please, you know, <laughs> that would solve the problem. <laughs> I can retire. So, you know, let's, let's hope that that happens someday and they decentralize the whole web. Um, but until then, you know, we need speeches like these. So, again, thank you very much. It was really good. Thank you. All right.